So yeah, today's the second half of the process scheduling discussion, and we're going to spend some time talking about real-time systems because they have some interesting issues that they have to deal with. Um, we all we all have systems with real-time scheduling requirements. Anybody who plays YouTube videos or um, watches lecture recordings or or you know plays iTunes or any kind of media typically will have some kind of real-time scheduling requirements associated with it. So. We all have it now, but then it's used for a lot of different uh, other applications all the time. Like you buy a new car and it has anti-lock braking. Well, that's got a real-time system built into it to um, manage the braking of the wheels and so forth. So there's a, and even like my wife and I are looking at a Subaru and it's got like these cameras. You know, like the the new Subarus have these cameras that watch the road, and obviously there's some real-time scheduling requirements built into those systems. So anyway, they typically are driven by events, maybe a timer, that's a good common one, um, but it could be other things as well, depending on, you know, if you have an assembly line and cars are moving through, then there's going to be switches and so forth, triggering, and then some software needs to run when a particular switch triggers so that the, uh, the system can do the appropriate thing. So um, we're going to look a little bit more into the detail of this. First of all, you have this issue of event latency, which is the event occurs, and then you actually have the service routine starting to run. So that's an important detail in these systems. Uh, we want to keep event latency as small as possible. And um, the challenge is um, event latency and um, various concurrency issues play together really strongly. So for example, if you have a kernel that doesn't support kernel preemption, so I can't interrupt something else that's going on, then the event latency can be increased by that kind of a situation. So you can imagine the kind of things that would interfere with these kinds of things. Okay, um, hard real-time systems, I, I talked about this in the first week, so I know we don't have to spend too much time on it. Um, but hard real-time systems basically have a requirement. I must meet my deadlines or the system has failed. So that really is what, I mean, if you imagine Anti-lock braking. Well, if I miss that anti-lock braking schedule and the car slides off the side of the mountain, that's bad. That's like the system has failed. So um, hard real-time systems are, uh, have this requirement. Soft real-time systems tend to be much more flexible. We don't care if we miss a deadline. And so, um, like I say here on the slide, typically we really only guarantee that those will be the highest priority tasks. You'll see why when we talk about these things today. Now again, you may ask the question, somebody asked the question last time, well, with a hard real-time system, how can we actually guarantee that we'll hit every deadline? And um, typically the way it's done is by carefully gating what jobs are allowed. So we only gate, we only allow jobs that we think we can su successfully complete uh, before the deadline. And typically there's also a design aspect of it. So this, the software running the anti-lock braking system isn't also running some other irrelevant software, right? It's only going to be doing that one important thing. So it's easy to make it hit its deadlines. Okay, so the latencies are uh, involved in the system's response. So you have inter interrupt latency. So this is a tricky one. This is the interrupt occurs, so whatever line goes low or line goes high going into the processor or the interrupt controller saying, hey, something important needs to be taken care of. And then the interrupt service routine actually running. Now that's the code that's responsible for dealing with the circumstance. So we've talked before about all the steps that have to occur between a line going higher, a line going low into the CPU, and the interrupt service routine actually running. So we'll talk about that. We'll ex explore that a little bit today. And then you have dispatch latency, which is basically, so something has happened and then I need to switch to the process that's actually responsible for dealing with this task. So you can imagine that if we had the interrupt service routine being the thing handling the problem, then we wouldn't have dispatch latency because we just switch into the kernel, take care of it, and switch back. But we're talking about something that's being implemented as a separate process. So that definitely plays a role. Sorry, I was almost falling asleep in my office, so I was like, I better get a coffee. Make sure I have that on hand. Okay, uh, so here we have time going to the right, we have some, some tasks going on, and then an interrupt occurs. So think about all the things that have to happen. First of all, current instruction has to complete. Ideally, it's not a slow instruction. If it's a divide, then we're kind of screwed because divides take a long time. 
hopefully it's not a memory access that's missing all the caches or something like that. So CPU has to complete an instruction. Now, interestingly enough, of course, one of our strategies for dealing with concurrency properly was disabling interrupts. Well, if interrupts are disabled, then this interrupt occurring is going to be postponed. It's going to be delayed. The delivery is going to be delayed until interrupts are re-enabled. So again, you can see how um, if we're using interrupts disabling and enabling to control concurrency, that can really interfere with having fast servicing of interrupts. Okay, so the CPU has this mechanism. It looks up in the interrupt descriptor table. What uh, service re routine do I want to run? We dispatch to that. Now remember, this is part of the OS kernel. So first thing that happens when we interrupt the, uh, enter into the interrupt service routine is we save all the registers because we don't know what was being interrupted. We don't know if it was a process. We don't know if it was some other kernel task. So we save all of those uh, registers and so forth. We basically context switch away from the task. So that's basically what we mean when we describe this. And we end up in the interrupt service routine. Okay. So you have a rather significant amount of work that occurs just to get from the interrupt occurring to the interrupt service routine starting to run. And you can imagine that we'd like this to be as fast, as simple, and efficient as possible. It's almost one of those things where if you have a big general purpose processor, that your, your dispatch latency may be, or your interrupt latency, I should be careful, um, your interrupt latency may be larger than if you have a small SIPL processor with less state to save and so forth. So it's kind of an interesting little detail there. Okay, So that's interrupt latency. Um, this is what I was talking about before. If we have code that just disables interrupts in order to deal with synchronization, then obviously that's going to be a pretty serious issue. Um, one of the things that, uh, you know, fortunately you guys don't have to think about this very much, right? You have a single core system, you don't really have crazy, I mean, you may run into some situations where you're missing timer ticks because, um, like, it, it seems like every year students put assertions into their timer handling code and they'll put other... Um, good, like good software, um, you know, engineering behaviors. They'll 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 try to add debug code and things like that into their timer routines, and then they start missing clocks. And it's like, so you typically you want to guard those things with an if def or something like that, so that you can turn it on and turn it off. But uh, even those kinds of things can affect that. But in general, you don't have to worry about big timing issues. So that's good. Anyway, um, so real-time systems try to keep interrupts disabled for as little as possible because they want to keep the interrupt latency as small as possible. And then kernel preemption is another thing. If I can interrupt other kernel control paths as much as possible, then that also will allow me to get from interrupt occurring to interrupt handler responding as quickly as possible. Okay? So that's, that's another aspect of these real-time systems. Okay, so this was the picture. We had the task running. This was all the interrupt latency, so interrupt occurs, interrupt service routine starts to run. Okay. That was before. And uh, then we also have the dispatch latency. Okay. So basically what we're, uh, you know, the way that we're considering the system is that the interrupt has indicated that this process now has input, it now has a circumstance it needs to run, so it needs to be scheduled on the processor. That's the whole idea here is we need to get it onto the processor to start running it. This is a kind of a general purpose design uh, circumstance here. Okay, so basically, real-time process. Well, um, what if there's a higher priority process? Well, then the scheduler may decide somebody else should actually go rather than the, than the process that needs to handle this interrupt. So in this case, uh, one of the implications is that the real-time processes should be the highest processes uh, as far as priority in the entire system. And what you find is that basically every general purpose OS with real-time uh, scheduling capabilities says real-time processes are the highest priority. So it always puts them at the absolute top. Now obviously there's a caveat that they better not use the CPU for very long, but um, generally they behave this way, otherwise people wouldn't run those programs. Okay, now the second implication is that um, we need to support preemption. The Scheduler really needs to be able to preempt the process running on the processor. And what I mean by that is don't just record that the interrupt happened and that we need to get around to it the next time we have a scheduled, scheduled process switch. 
we need to be able to preempt the process running right now. And ideally, um, this would even include processes that are in kernel control paths. So I'm doing a read, I'm doing a write, and I'm copying a big buffer of data or something into the user space of the process. I should be able to interrupt the kernel uh, even in that situation so that we can get to the real-time process and run it as quickly as possible. These are kind of the, the implications of trying to shrink these latencies as much as possible. Okay, does that make sense? Basically, I think if you were studying this yourself for the first time, you would probably find all of this to be very straightforward to figure out. Okay, dispatcher has to be efficient. Duh, we want it to be efficient already. Um, the, there's another little wrinkle, and I think thankfully this doesn't occur very often, but you do have the possible issue that maybe the real-time process, when we get to running it, um, needs resources that some other lower priority process already holds. And so that's why in these discussions of real-time processes, you'll oftentimes see a little section in the sequence of operations devoted to conflicts or conflict resolution. This is the OS needs to reclaim resources that somebody else holds that the real-time process may want to access. Okay. Um, honestly, I can't tell you any more than that because I haven't encountered real-world examples of this. But um, nonetheless, in the discussion, they generally include this as one of the steps for dispatch latency. Set up for the process to run, and then switch to it. Okay, scheduling. Now, this is, um, I think, a lot more fun um, part of it, because to me, this is where all of the interesting nuances start showing up. Um, typically, now, you'll notice I say the real-time processes are periodic. This is a big assumption, and, and you'll see that I actually mentioned that in the first point, that we have assumptions about the way real-time processes behave. Do they have to be periodic? Not really. I mean, if it's like every time somebody opens the, uh, the door, a little switch goes off, and I want to respond with a you know, friendly greeting or something like that, well, that's not necessarily periodic. It's regular, you know, as, as long as the door is open regularly. But uh, anyway, so this is an assumption that real-time processes are periodic, and so we have some period that they have to execute on, okay? Now, we know that execution takes some amount of time, and so that typically is bounded, and so we can say that each period, we need to take a certain amount of time to actually complete the task within that period. So that's why it's at the end of the period, we're basically figuring out what is the latest that we can start this task and still finish it before the deadline. This is like what every Caltech student does all the time. Figure out what's the latest I can start this and still finish on time. So using that, um, you can sort of figure out you have a window to try to get each task completed. Okay? It's called a deadline. That probably isn't the clearest term. I like to call it a window just because you can start the processes processing any time in this window and you know you're going to hit the deadline. But if you miss the window, then you're done. You uh, know you're going to miss your deadline. Okay. Now, um, there are OSs that require you state your scheduling requirements. Obviously, if, if the OS is going to call you back on a periodic um, interval, then you have to tell it how often you want to be called back. Um, but then there may be other details as well, like I want to be really high priority, or this is the expected length of my CPU burst. Um, I think in general, general purpose OSs don't have to do that so much because they can observe that behavior. Also, the requirements aren't as crucial, so it's not, um, you know, it's not a big loss if I miss my scheduling requirement. So uh, you'll see a lot more flexibility and a lot less um, requirements of stating things up front on general purpose OSs. Okay, so the OS can make a decision, and this is really powerful. This actually gives the OS a great deal of control to be able to maintain certain guarantees. So basically we can say, I think I can schedule your request successfully on a, on a regular basis. So um, that's, you know, they're granted admission. And so we call these things admission control algorithms. And so you can say, sorry, I understand that you would like to do this, but it's not possible to hit my deadlines if I accept your request. And so that way you can control whether or not you're likely to actually hit these deadlines. Okay. So that's the idea there. OS can't schedule based on the requirements. The request is rejected. Otherwise, it's admitted. 
And uh, yeah, like I say here, this is for re hard real time where we have to hit these deadlines. And typically, um, it's not a general thing. I mean, typically these systems are designed to take care of specific things. And so if you have jobs that are rejected, you'd be like, oh, okay, well, maybe I need to redesign this system so that they'll always be accepted. All right, um, first scheduling algorithm we're going to talk about. This is one that we actually didn't talk about in CS24. Um, it's funny because when I was looking at the material uh, for the first time, I realized we went straight to the best algorithm right away in CS24. So we'll talk about that one too. We'll tell you why it's best too. Um, but an easy approach is to use what's called rate monotonic scheduling. Basically, it's a priority-based approach. We expect that processes are going to have a, a periodic schedule. And based on the length of the period, we set the priority. So the shorter the period, the higher the priority. The longer the period, the lower the priority. Okay, so priority inversely based on their period. Higher priority tasks preempt lower priority ones. And here's the statement. We're not going to approve it. We're going to just assert it. Um, but I'll point you at a research paper if you're curious. Uh, it's, it is optimal in terms of static priority. So if you have a set of real-time processes and um, you can assign them static priorities and it is possible to schedule them to be executed, then this will um, be able to do it. Okay? Like I say, if you have a set of processes that can't be scheduled by this algorithm, then no static set of priorities is able to uh, execute them. Okay? And we'll see why uh, as we dig into this. Okay, so uh, let's see. Lower priority processes can be preempted. So that's no biggie. We have time across the bottom. So the question is, is a set of processes really sched schedulable? Okay. And so let's see. We have, uh, yeah, this is all basically the same as before. So processes, when they execute, they occupy the CPU for a certain amount of time, then they finish, and then they can wait until the start of the next period. So here's the example. We're going to have one process, period of 50 clocks, highest priority because it has a 50 clock period, and CPU burst of 20 clocks. And then we have another one of 100 clocks and a CPU burst of 35 clocks. Okay, so it's got to run uh, once every 100 clocks and it'll use about 35 clocks. Okay, so these are the deadlines. You can see P1 has to finish by 50 and then P1 and P2 both have to finish by 100, so P1 for the second time, P1 at 150, and then both again by 200. Okay, so basically here's how this works. They both could start right at the beginning. Because remember, um, yeah, so P1 has a period of 50 clock, CPU burst of 20. So let's just eyeball this initially. So P1 has to finish by 50, has to start by at least 30, right? It's got to start by at least 30 so they can finish. And P2 has to finish by 100, so it's got to start by at least, what is it, 65, I think? 65 plus 35 is 100. So that's a sketch, but we know that P1 and P2, um, since they can both start running at the same time, P1 is higher priority, so it goes ahead and starts first. Okay. And this is easy, right? It runs for 20 clocks, then it's finished. Now P2 can run and it finishes. Now the nice thing is that P1 has hit its first deadline. But then once we get to this point, at clock 50, a new window opens for P1. Right? So now we're worried about the next deadline. And since we get into that new window for P1, even though P2 has been running, it's run for 30 clocks now, but it still needs about 5 more clocks, well, it gets preempted. Right, And so P1 interrupts P2 and finishes. So it, again, occupies 20 clocks, finishes. So now P1 is taken care of for this second deadline. And then we go back to P2, and it finishes. It runs for its approximately five additional clocks, and then it's finished. Okay, Everybody see how this works? So everybody hit their deadlines? Everybody will keep hitting their deadlines. Obviously, this can continue on because basically now we're idle and this would just continue on um, from this point forward, right? Okay, so you can see that we have 
spare time, right? We have all of this luxurious, what, 25 clocks left over every 100 clocks. So if we look at this, um, you can actually do this interesting calculation called the CPU utilization. And you might even have eyeballed this from the very beginning. Okay, out of every 50 clocks, I need 20 of them. Okay, so out of every 100 clocks, I need 40 of them. And so you could actually do that calculation as what percentage of the total CPU time does this process need. Okay, so P1's utilization is 0.4. P2, same thing, 35 over 100. Okay, so that's uh, 0.35. And if you look at this, you say, well, the total CPU utilization is 0.75, three quarters. We have 25 clocks left over that are idle, so it seems like we're on the right track, right? So the question is, can you use CPU utilization to tell if a set of real-time processes can be scheduled? Okay. This was an interesting question that researchers asked. So to show you, here's another example. So now P1 takes 25 clocks instead of 20, and P2 has a shorter period. So now, um, instead of having a 100 clock period, now it has an 80 clock period. Okay. And, uh, yeah, so these are the deadlines again. So you can see when P1's deadlines are and P2's deadlines and so forth. And if you did the calculation, you say, okay, 25 over 50, that's easy, 0. 0.5. P2's CPU utilization, so 35 over 80. So that's more now. I think both of them are more, but still it adds up to um, 0.94, give or take, right? So it seems like we're good. We're not using 100% of the CPU utilization. We're using less than 100%, so we're probably okay. So here's the question. Can we actually use rate monotonic scheduling? So let's actually simulate this on the slideware version of this. Okay, so we start out. P1 and P2 are both in their windows. P1 has to finish, so we said uh, 25, so it has to start at least by 25. P2 takes 35, so um, go back, so that has to start by 45. We know that we're in the window for both of these, but P1 has the shorter period, so it has to run first. It has the higher priority. Okay, so it executes 25, you know, fills up the first 25 cycles, then P2 starts to run. Okay. But remember that when we pass the first deadline for P1, we get into the next window for P1. So, who's the higher priority? Well, P1 takes over again. Okay. So it runs. Finally, P2 gets the CPU back. But it doesn't quite have enough time to finish its task. Everybody see that? So... Rate monotonic scheduling has limitations as far as being able to schedule processes. Okay? And it's this weird thing that even though we have less than 100% CPU utilization, we still can't schedule these two simple tasks. Okay? So this turned out that somebody figured out that there's a, uh, an actual mathematical relationship between these things. So like it says on the slide, for end real-time processes, the CPU utilization has an upper limit. And for two processes, it's given right there. It's got to be less than or equal to 0.828, which is really weird, but that's its limit. And as then goes to infinity, you see that the CPU utilization settles out at about 0.69. Okay. So interesting result that when you have these real-time processes that are scheduled on a regular period, um, if you use, okay, and so what is, the, what is the issue here? The issue is that we've assigned static priorities to all of the processes. If we always, if any time we have a choice between P1 and P2, P1 always wins. That's, that's just the rule. And that introduces some fundamental limitations into what the system's capable of scheduling. Okay, so um, like you say here, this is the research paper. If you're curious, uh, and looking into more of these details, that's the one that actually has its result. Um, Liu was at MIT, and Leyland was at JPL. So um, JPL's been involved in this kind of thing for quite a while.
All right, any questions about rate monotonic? Kind of interesting. It's an inter interesting result. This is certainly not something I would have ever guessed looking at it at first blush, but um, you can see, given static priorities, it's got certain limitations. Okay, now the scheduling algorithm we discussed in CS24 very briefly, we talked about it for about 10 minutes, um, is called earliest deadline first. And basically, what this does is it looks at whose deadline is closest and then says, your highest priority because your deadline is closest. So now we have dynamically assigned priorities rather than statically assigned uh, priorities. And that changes everything, really. Okay, so earlier a deadline, or the we can say another way of describing it is uh, the closer it is, the higher the priority will be. Okay, so processes do need to state their deadlines. And that seems like a perfectly reasonable thing. You also notice that we kind of have to know their um, CPU burst lengths, but... Um, We'll get there, right? So previous example, P1 has a period of 50 clocks, CPU bursts are 25 clocks, and P2 has a period of 80 clocks and a CPU burst of 35 clocks. In this case, um, remember, the rate monotonic scheduling couldn't do this. So earliest deadline first. This is where it starts to get complicated. Again, when we're at time zero, we could schedule either one because both are ready to go, both are in their window, so we need to get them running. And because of that, we look at the deadlines. P1's deadline is closer, so P1 runs first. And so it goes ahead and runs to completion, okay, because that's perfectly fine. So P2 begins running. Okay. Now we've hit the end of P1's first window, so we're going to have the next window. So 50, the next window will be at... 100, okay? But this time, since P2's deadline is before P1's deadline, P2 is higher priority. So it gets to finish. It's funny, just a slight little change in how we manage the priorities of these things makes all the difference, okay? And so we're perfectly happy with that. Now, um, what happens next? So you can imagine, so we have 80, 160 is the next deadline for P2. We're already in P1's window, so it should start running right away. Okay. And so it runs, and you know, even once we enter P2's next window, well, P1 is obviously before P2 as far as deadlines are concerned. So P1's going to continue running until it finishes. Now this deadline is hit, and We've entered P2's window, so P2 can run. Okay, so it starts running. But now we have another interesting scenario because P2's run, and now we've entered into P1's third window and because P1 has another deadline at 150. Okay. So now if P1 has a deadline at 150 and P2 has a deadline at two or 160, then now P1 is higher priority again. So... That means P1 gets to preempt P2 and run. How much CPU time are we idling right now? We haven't idled at all. So you can see how this works hard to hit deadlines, and it totally does. Anyway, so P2 runs to completion, and you end up with a little bit left over. If I remember correctly, this is going to be idle and then we basically start the cycle over again. Okay? So you guys see how this works? It's pretty cool. You know, by dynamically assigning these priorities, we can hit these deadlines and we don't waste CPU time. We don't make uh, limiting choices. All right, so it's kind of neat because um, it turns out that you don't actually need periodicity for this scheduling algorithm to work. You could actually, all you need is for the process to say, this is when I need to uh, schedule. This is when I need to be finished by. Okay. So that's kind of neat that uh, you can do this. So you can actually do this for more general purpose, kind of like event-driven system if you wanted to versus just a periodic scheduling system. Okay. Also, I mentioned that uh, rate monotonic was like um, sort of the best, you know, they consider it optimal in the sense that if it can be done with static priorities, that algorithm can do it. 
Okay. Earliest deadline first is able to schedule the CPU for 100% and hit all the deadlines. So as long as you have a set of processes that has CPU utilization of 100% or less, it can do it, which is pretty neat. Okay. Um, the thing is, is that like that's theoretical. <laughs> um, it's just like having a frictionless pulley and massless springs and and uh, rope that doesn't stretch and things like that. Event latency adds up, and so that's a little epsilon that's going to add in for every process. You have to worry about context switching between and and all of these kinds of things. And then obviously there's uh, latency in the kernel as well. Um, that would have to be characterized in some way if you wanted to try to um, do admission control on this. So um, that prevents us from achieving the 100% utilization. But I expect you could probably come pretty dang close. So that's, that's neat. Okay, any questions about real-time scheduling? Again, this is one of those things where it makes me really sad, but I have to tell you, you don't get really much of a chance to play with this in Pintos. Makes me sad. Um, it's another one of those things that seems really neat, and I would love for you all to play with it, but just don't have the practical opportunity at the moment. But at least you've seen these cool ideas. Okay, um, next thing that I wanted to talk about, I did tell you that I was going to talk about this, was the crazy Linux schedulers. So all the way up to 2.4, I think, so all the way up to, but not including 2.4, they used a multi-level feedback queue strategy. And I talked about that last time, how multi-level feedback queues typically are implemented. So um, basically what happened after 2.4 is they said, you know what, multi-level feedback queues is okay, but we have all these other really cool ideas. Let's start exploring them. And I really love that they're so flexible about doing that because being open source, being a large um, interested, involved development community makes this kind of thing more possible. So... 2.4 scheduler. Time is broken into epics. Okay, so we say this is a chunk of time, this is a chunk of time, this is a chunk of time. They're epics. And basically, every process gets a priority assigned to it at the beginning of each epic. Okay? So like I say here, real-time processes are at the top, as you would expect. Uh, interactive processes, based on their behavior, you know, so you watch the previous epic, how were you, how well-behaved or badly behaved, and we're going to assign you a priority for the next epic. Okay? And then batch processes, ones that are preempted regularly and so forth, those end up at the lowest priority. Okay? And so priorities are used to compute a time quantum. And this is kind of an interesting thing, but each process is allocated. They basically, it's like a bank. Here's the amount, you know, here's your allowance for the next epic. This is how much CPU you're allowed to have for the next epic. Okay? So different processes have different size quantums, and curiously enough, the high priority processes get larger quantums, okay, or quanta, I suppose I should say. And basically, you have a couple of options. If you completely consume your quantum, you're done for that, uh, that epic, I think, and then somebody else gets to run. Okay. But obviously, if you yield or, or block, then you're not going to consume your whole quantum. Okay, so the scheduler gets invoked. It's got to make a choice. Who gets to run next? Basically, it goes through and does some calculations to decide which process is most appropriate to run on the CPU next. And you can see that it has all these little tweaks in it, which is kind of interesting. So take the priority, you take CPU affinity, a um, few other details, and say, okay, I think process so-and-so should run next. And so it gets assigned to the CPU and then it runs either until it yields blocks or terminates or its uh, quantum is consumed. Okay? Higher priority processes can preempt, as one would generally expect in these general purpose OSs. Uh, preemption is the norm. And so, uh, yes, yeah, so like I say, if the higher priority process becomes runnable, let's say because disk data becomes available or uh, character device data, somebody types on the console, data becomes available, well, now that process preempts and gets to start running. And so once everybody has consumed their entire allowance for that epic, then the epic's over. So that was the 2.4 scheduler. And um, it was quite interesting. It seemed to work pretty well. 
But um, you know, you could actually control that every process would get the processor at least a minimal amount per epoch. I mean, that's obviously an issue that you have when you're designing a schedule. You want to make sure that every process gets the processor for a certain amount of time. Um, and if you want to bias toward certain kinds of behaviors, you want to bias toward interactive processes, give them a larger quantum, make them higher priority, and then they get the CPU right away. Okay. So that's neat, but looking at this, I want you to think about all the parameters that are require tuning in this approach. Okay. I mean, you have, how big is the epic? What's the minimum and maximum quantum size? What about all this other fudgy stuff with the goodness of a process to, to pick it who should run next? Okay? So there's a lot of knobs on this. Okay? And you kind of have to tune them. And they have a benchmark for testing interactivity in the, in the OS scheduler. So um, they could tweak the properties, run it, see how it does. Okay? So I want you to think about that because we're going to come back to that. Okay? So the start of the next epic, we go through, look at how everybody did, compute a new priority. And so basically this scheduler didn't scale. That was a big problem with it. It just would not scale because you have all these ON computations that have to happen as the uh, scheduler runs okay, from epic to epic. So basically the 2.6 scheduler came along and it was the exact same algorithm but made as efficiently as possible. That was the idea. We want to try to make this but as efficient as possible. Okay. So it's called the O1 scheduler. I love the naming here. You'll see that again. But they actually, um, uh, the people who name these things either had a sense of humor or a sense of pride that I have never seen. So anyway, the O1 scheduler. So we still have epics, um, but it's not as formal, or at least the work that you do when one epic ends and another epic starts is um, a lot smaller. And so it's not denoted. Or, or uh, you know, you don't you don't uh, separate them nearly as strong. So you have a priority array, and one thing to mention is that there are a fixed number of priorities. So we know how many entries are, uh, yeah, how many entries are in this array, but each one of them is a queue of processes. Okay. And then you have a bitmap, and again, the bitmap is a fixed size because the priority array is a fixed size, and basically, a one in the bitmap says yes, there's processes at that priority. So you would have a bit, you can see in the um, second or rightmost, I don't know, you'd have to decide what order the bits ought to be in. But I'll just tell you, it looks like, according to my diagram, that the second or right bit is one because the second or highest priority Q has processes in it, okay, and so forth. So the idea is that you can use this to look up the highest priority process that's runnable in constant time. So that's the first thing. I need to be able to look things up quickly. So, um, and remember, what do we mean by constant time? We're just saying that there's a constant that's an upper bound. So even though we might have, like, say, 32 queues or something like that, well, 32 is bounded by a constant. And so uh, I can do that lookup, and uh, I know it'll be a constant time operation. Okay, that's the idea. Now, there's two priority arrays. And um, again, how do we actually make this efficient. Let me, let me back up because um, I just got through telling you that there is a priority array. That's the current epic. That's the idea is that this is the current epic. This is the state of who is able to run, what priority queue they're in, and we consume the processes from this epic. So there's a second priority array and the second array holds the expired processes. So processes that have consumed their entire allowance for that epic. So they've consumed their entire time slice. That's the expired array. And so when you finish using your entire quantum, you get migrated. And you can see that when you migrate, the kernel does a little calculation to decide, well, what's your next epic priority? So we just slide it over. And so that happens for all the things. So you can see that um, some might stay at the same priority level, some might go up, some might go down. I guess in this one they all either stayed the same or went down. Um, but just based on the behavior, you would move processes into the corresponding position in the expired collection. Now when you're done, all you do is switch active and expired. You just swap those two pointers, 
and now you're ready to start a new epic. So you can see that it's the same concept as the 2.4 scheduler, but just implemented efficiently. You know, and, it, and instead of having these big chunks of time where you make everybody wait and you do work, you have these little, you spread it out and you do a whole bunch of little chunks of computation. And you don't have to iterate over these collections or anything like that. You just do each one step by step. Okay, does that make sense? So O1 scheduler, everything is O1. How awesome is that? Okay. So that's nice, but what I want you to think about again is what I was telling you before. What's the quantum size? How do we compute that? What's the epic length? How do we compute that? Or how do we tune that so that we make everything uh, happy? How do we compute these fudge factors that we use to figure out what pro um, process to run next and so forth? So it was complicated. And that was a thing that, you know, I remember actually because a lot of this was happening when I had first started teaching. And so I was reading about this stuff in some of the articles on the internet. People saying, yeah, tweak this little parameter and suddenly the scheduler is terrible. You know, the interactivity just falls through the floor or something like that. So um, there was a lot of frustration about that. And so there was a switch to another very... Um, Love the name, right? Um, very uh, aggressively named, completely fair scheduler. And it was funny because I was actually just looking up some background details for this lecture, and it turns out that just recently there was a um, a patch for the Linux kernel to make the completely fair scheduler even fairer. So it's like completely and utterly fair now. But anyway, it's called the completely fair scheduler. And um, you'll the other thing that I want to mention here is you'll notice. 2.6.23. We're like, I don't remember what kernel version we're in, but we're in like 4 point something, right? I think, yeah, so you guys know. 4.12. 4 okay, so that's quite a while. That, um, so the CFS has a lot more longevity than a lot of schedulers for Linux, which is kind of funny. But uh, anyway, it's been used for quite a while. So completely fair scheduler has a cool design principle. And basically, um, it's an example of what would be called a proportional share scheduler or a fair share scheduler, where basically we want to make sure that every process gets a fair chunk or a fair share of the scheduler. Check the time. Okay, we've got six minutes. We should be good. So um, what should be a fair share? Well, it depends on the priority. If I have an interactive process, it should get a fairer share or a bigger share of the CPU. If it's a, a batch process, if it's a compute intensive process, well, it's a lower priority. So really, proportionally, it should get a lower share of the CPU if other things also need to run. Okay. So basically what happens, mm. every process has a virtual clock associated with it. So this virtual runtime is a little bit confusing, but you can think of it as a virtual clock that starts at zero. Okay. And the clock runs forward every time the process is on a CPU. So the process is on a CPU, it's doing things, its clock is running. Okay. Now it's called a virtual runtime because the clock actually runs faster or slower based on the priority of the process. So if you have a high priority process, the clock runs really slow. So you can see there's relativistic effects going on here. If you're a low priority batch process, the clock runs a lot faster. And so what this does is makes it look like high priority processes haven't run for as long as low priority processes. This is really interesting single knob that you can adjust per process. You know, how do we how do we scale the clock progressing um, to represent how long the process has had the, the processor? Okay. Now all the processes that are ready, okay, so that means that they could run if they have the CPU, remember. Um, if a process is blocked, it's not participating in this mechanism. It'll remember these details, like the scheduler has to, but um, we really only care about the ready processes. So ready processes are in a red-black tree, and this is um, ordered based on how far the virtual clock has progressed. Okay. So again, think about it. High priority, clock runs really slow, so its clock will look like it's not run very long. Batch processes will be further down. Their, their virtual clock will have gone faster. So those will be in the higher runtime areas. So red-black tree, log in time to insert a process into the tree. 
The leftmost, so if you think about the way the tree would be structured, the bottom left process would be the one that's run for the shortest amount of time, but that's virtual. So we're biasing toward higher priority processes, ones that haven't gotten to run very much. Okay. So like it says here, they have the greatest need for the CPU. Now there is a special variable that keeps track of this in the scheduler so that um, we can figure out the next process to run easily, okay? which makes obvious sense um, that you would have something like that. And so time quanta are based on various details. Again, you have to do some fudging here. Targeted latency. How much time should pass before every process gets at least one go on the CPU? That's the targeted latency. So, um, yeah, I think that's sort of the maximal interval that you'll have between being on the CPU in general. Let's see, total number of processes in the system. So again, this is something where um, if there's very few processes, individual processes can have more time on the processor than if uh, there's a ton of processes, then we need to shrink down everybody's proportional chunk. Okay. So we have a flexible thing here. The targeted latency can be varied. And so basically using just this information, the completely fair scheduler makes its scheduling choices. And it's kind of, it's, it's been working pretty freaking well. It's kind of surprising. Okay, so general behavior, processes that block or yield, well, they'll have lower run times. That's pretty obvious because they simply will not have been on the CPU. And so when they actually become ready, they'll probably end up in the bottom left of that red black tree and they'll probably get the CPU pretty quick because they just haven't run very much. Okay. And like I say here, <laughs> No idea how long Linux will stick with a completely fair scheduler. Um, wh when I first created this slide deck, um, it was relatively young. and so. Um, but now, they've been using it for quite a while. I, I guess it's just sort of like how long it is before somebody comes up with some other interesting new idea and they start uh, using it instead. Okay. Um, there's also another scheduler. Um, I don't know, is anybody familiar with the other scheduler that people have tinkered with in Linux? So it's got a bad word in it, so I'm not going to say it while all the recording's running. But um, yeah, so you can research that if you want. It's kind of interesting, but it's a similar idea. Does anybody have any questions about this one before we wrap? Okay, so that's the idea behind the Linux schedulers. I think it's good to be somewhat familiar with them if you're going to say you know about schedulers. Um, this is all part of a, um, like I was saying, proportional share algorithms are really interesting and there's been some interesting research on them. So um, there's a research paper that I really like, as is evidenced by the fact that I almost, <laughs> not, like, out of four years I probably have CS24 exam questions from this paper like twice out of four years. So um, if you want the stride of that. So, uh, but there's a, some really interesting scheduling algorithms that are discussed in there, and, and the completely fair scheduler is kind of a variant of, of these approaches. Okay, so um, if there's no questions, then we'll go ahead and wrap up. I'll see you next time.